Hello, my name is Dean Miller, and I am so thankful today that David Kenny has given me the opportunity to present a lesson to you in this very timely worded name of the program, Light from Above. Today what I would like to do is provide for you exactly what the title of this particular program indicates. I would like to share with you some light from above. The Bible's a book, but it's more than that. It's a book from God. And being a book from God, it provides light from above. And so in this particular program, what I would like to encourage you to do is if you happen to have access to a Bible, maybe on your pad or your phone, or maybe a hard copy type Bible, I would like to encourage you to open your Bible on this particular program study to the book of James and let us spend a little bit of time together with a passage that I think is a very special and practical passage in James chapter 4. Again, the book in the Bible we're looking at is the book of James. And one of the things that distinguishes this book is it's a book of great practical everyday teaching. As a matter of fact, somebody has written a little devotional commentary on this particular book of the Bible and called it what Christian living is all about. And that certainly is descriptive of the contents of the book of James. If you take a look at the book of James, what you can see is he deals with a lot of very practical, everyday things that can help us with our life. He begins by talking about in chapter 1, turning our trials into triumphs. And who doesn't have trials? And who doesn't want to turn those trials into triumphs? Sometimes we struggle in relation to our attitude toward God. James discusses this in James chapter 1. He also discusses in James chapter 1 about the struggle that we have with temptation. And he explains about the process of the enticement that can sometimes lead to sin in our life. In James chapter 1, he also talks about our need to receive with meekness the implanted word that God has provided for us. In chapter 2, he talks about how that we ought to treat other people right. We're specifically warned about how that we need to be careful not to show favoritism toward people, some sort of partiality toward people, on grounds where it shouldn't be shown. And especially in James chapter 2, at the outset of the chapter, he encourages us to basically practice the golden rule. Treat other people the way we want to be treated, with the respect appropriate to other human beings. In James chapter 2, the writer also talks about the nature of faith. He helps us to understand what saving faith really is all about and how it's displayed in our life by our lifestyle choices. In chapter 3, he explains to us about the challenges that we have in regard to our tongue and sometimes not controlling our tongue and the trouble and the dysfunction and even collateral damage that can occur because we don't control our tongues. Well, on and on the book of James goes talking about all sorts of practical, everyday issues that can be very helpful to us. As a matter of fact, if you have not done this before, I certainly recommend the book of James as a great homework assignment at least once a week, every week in your life. It really is a good reminder of how life ought to be lived and how life can be lived consistent with God's will to glorify Him and to be a blessing to us. Now, it's with that little introduction to the first part of the book of James, I want to encourage us together to take a look at James chapter 4, and particularly at a passage that begins at verse 13. In the book of James, a lot of the book has to do with practical, everyday Christian living. But in this particular section at James 4 and verse 13, he really opens it up and takes a more panoramic view of life. And it certainly is something that we need to think about, not just those of us who are Christians, but also those of us maybe who are not Christians, but maybe we're truth seekers. Maybe we want to know what the truth is, and we're open to the idea of thinking about life differently than a lot of people do. Well, James chapter 4, beginning at verse 13 through the end of the chapter, can help us with that exercise to see life differently than a lot of people do. If I were sectioning off different sections of the book of James, 
and I was sectioning off James chapter 4, starting with verse 13, I would head this paragraph with these three words, facts about life. They're not just facts about the Christian life. They're facts about life in this world. You know, a fact is different than an opinion. A fact is different than a mere personal perspective. When we talk about facts, we're talking about reality. We're talking about truth. We're talking about things that are true, whether or not we accept them as true or not, whether we live consistent with those truths or not. Facts are facts. Whether or not we know them or whether or not we accept them, they're facts. James 4, verse 13, from the very mouth of God, light from above, about facts of life, starting with James 4, 13. Listen or follow along if you would. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and buy and sell and get gain, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. If you take a look at this passage from the perspective of wanting to know essential, critical facts about life, I want to suggest to you that there are at least three in this passage. Three facts about life. Number one, we know from this passage, life is uncertain. Did you notice, do you remember reading what James chapter 4 and verse 14 said? Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. I imagine that there are probably some of us who have already experienced some days or some phases in our life where we came to appreciate from those experiences the fact that we did not have a clue about what that day was going to be like until we experienced it. Just recently, I had an opportunity to minister to a, a lady, 55 years old. She went to the emergency room of her local hospital. She went there because she was having some headaches, and she had just gotten to the point where she couldn't handle it any longer. So she went to the hospital at 5.30 that afternoon. At 11 o'clock, I received a call from her husband, and she had been diagnosed with cancer. She went from 5.30 that day to being a 55-year-old lady with a headache problem that had been lingering. From 5.30 to 11 o'clock, she had become a cancer patient. Her life changed dramatically. I'm sure when she got up that morning, she didn't know what that day was going to be like. We often take for granted the fact that tomorrow is going to come. We almost act as if that's certain. As a matter of fact, we get to the point where we are so confident about that, that because we got up this morning, we're going to get up tomorrow morning. And because we went to work Today, we're going to go to work tomorrow. But the fact is, life is uncertain. The fact is, what James wrote in James 4 and verse 14, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. The fact is, what Mark Twain said is true. We are all ignorant just about different things. But then again, there are some things that we are all ignorant of. And one of the things that we are all ignorant of is about tomorrow. We just can't be certain 
about tomorrow. Life is uncertain. We are very ignorant in regard to actually how long our life will be or what each day might cause us to experience. The fact is, we need to embrace our ignorance. We, I think, will concede that we know that we don't know for sure about tomorrow. But we have a hard time embracing that reality in our life and practicing that truth in our own life. We do not know what will happen tomorrow. The reason why? Because life is uncertain. We just don't know about the next day. We don't know, actually, about the next hour. You know, sometimes we are so cocksure that because we are leaving from point X and we are going to our destination of plan, location Y, but sometimes in that travel, things happen. Even the most cautious of us, the most careful of drivers, the most experienced of drivers can have things happen where they experience things they never thought they would ever experience. You see, life is uncertain. We need to live life in light of the reality that, number one, life is uncertain. There's a second fact about life that's shared in this passage. As a matter of fact, it is in the very same verse, James 4 and verse 14. The passage again says, You do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Most of us have seen, if we do not have one, a tea kettle sitting on a range or stove. The water is heated and the vapor rises and then the vapor disappears. Your life, James said, by the inspiration of God, is like a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. He's not talking there about the quality of our life, but what he's talking about is the length of our life. It's brief, like the brevity that we witness when the tea kettle sprouts up its steam. Life certainly is brief. In visiting a number of older folks through the years, including those at home as well as those in the nursing home, I have never had any older person say, Oh, Preacher Dean, I have lived such a long, long life. What I hear universally from older people, and I am fast getting there myself, is they talk about the brevity of their life, how swiftly their life has passed, no matter how old that they are. A number of years ago, when I was just in my late 20s, I was speaking at a youth retreat over the weekend, and at this youth retreat, there was an old man, I would have called him back then, there was this old man who had such bravery that he decided to chaperone this group of teenagers from his local church to this weekend youth retreat. I don't remember for sure about what his name was, but I distinctly remember my experience with him. I was so impressed with his outgoing spirit, with his positive, optimistic attitude, and his willingness to take on the challenge of chaperoning this group of teenagers from his local church, I was so impressed with that man, especially being that kind of a man at that age in his life. Now, remember, I was in my late 20s. I had heard that he had just turned 70, and I was amazed and thought, what's it like to turn 70 years old? Now, to me at that time, that was old. And I said, brother... What's it like to be 70 years old? I was amazed at him being 70. I'll never forget his response. I may have forgotten his name, but I'll never forget his response. He said, Dean, it's like the blink of an eye 
That's how fast his life had passed by. It was like the blink of an eye. But he had lived 70 years. But he was beginning to appreciate the brevity of life, even if it's 70 years. I've heard that same expression about the swiftness of life from folks in their 80s and even into their 90s. Life is brief. The Apostle Paul talked about that very thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and in verse 18. At the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he explains as he is teaching here Christians a more mature perspective about life. He says, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things that are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Temporary. That's a good word to use to describe this life. No matter how long it is, it's temporary, and in the panoramic perspective of eternity, it is brief. As a matter of fact, it is so brief that even those of us who live in this world come to accept and embrace the concept that life is brief even if it were to last 70, 80, or even more than 90 years. Psalm 90 and verse 10, as a matter of fact, suggests to us that life expectancy, as a general rule, and there are many, of course, exceptions, but as a general rule, 70 years, if by reason of strength, 80 years. But then the psalmist says, it is soon gone and we fly away. Life in this world is temporary. It's brief no matter how long it is. We need to live life in light of, number one, the uncertainty of life, and number two, in light of the brevity of life. There's a third fact about life here in this passage in James chapter 4, and it's in verse 16. Listen to this passage. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. I want to suggest to you that in this particular passage, Planning is not being discouraged, but what's being discouraged and what is being criticized here is planning with an arrogant attitude, thinking as if we had absolute certainty about our future, thinking as if we could be confident for sure about the things that we're thinking about doing in our life. Arrogant planning is not only wrong, it's not only impractical, it is sinful. It's an expression of human arrogance. You see, the picture that's being painted here in James chapter 4 is these itinerant businessmen getting together and they're thinking about their business game plan. And their business game plan suggests that they ought to go to this particular city, a location. Their activity is identified by buying and selling. And they're so arrogant that not only are they sure about their location, not only are they sure about their activity, it even says they're going to make a profit. Those who have been in business very long know that sometimes you don't always make a profit in your business. But they were so arrogantly planning as if they were in total control of their future. And it's that spirit and that attitude that's being addressed in James chapter 4 as it says, But now you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. It reminds me of that story in Luke chapter 12. The story that Jesus told about the foolish farmer. He had yielded a tremendous crop and he observed that he had a tremendous harvest that he now needed to take care of. And in Luke chapter 12, the man as he thought about his prosperity and the plenty of his harvest, in Luke chapter 12 verse 17 it says, and he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater and there I will store all of my crops and my goods. See, he was so sure he had a future. 
It was as if his prosperity, in his mind, had guaranteed his future. And so he's arrogantly planning as if there's no contingency, as if there's nothing else that can happen except what he plans to happen. And then that foolish farmer is said to have been told in Luke chapter 12 and verse 19, But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And then whose will those things be which you have provided? See, he had arrogantly planned for his future, thinking as if he was in total control. And the reality is none of us are. That's why the suggestion about how we ought to live is in the phrase, if the Lord wills. He says, for instance, in James chapter 4 and verse 15, instead you ought to say, see, here's the spirit that we ought to have about life. Here's the way life ought to be lived. James 4 verse 15. You ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. Sometimes the Lord's will is conceived of by us and we mean by that the Lord's desire, what He prefers or what He wants. But in this particular context, it's the idea of what the Lord permits. There are some things that the Lord has permitted in this fallen world that's not what He would have desired. It certainly wasn't His first choice. But He did permit it. If we have a tomorrow, it's because the Lord permits it. If we have a next year, it's because the Lord permits it. You know, it used to be that there was, amongst people who were Christians, or at least faith-based in their life, sometimes years ago, we used to hear people say, Lord willing, and then they would say something about their future, indicating that they knew that they weren't in total control. And they knew everything hinged on the Lord permitting them to accomplish whatever it is that they had planned. Well, it's in that spirit that we ought to live. I don't think that James is suggesting here that before we make reference to anything in the future, we have to say as a rite, as an R-I-T-E, as a ritual, if the Lord wills. We don't have to preface every statement we make about the future with that statement prefacing it. But it's in that spirit that we ought to live. And maybe sometimes it would be good for us to say that relative to our future. The fact is, life needs to be lived in light of the reality that we are not in total control. That actually the Lord is sovereign and whatever we experience, it's because the Lord permits it. The fact is, life is uncertain, life is brief, and sometimes life can be tempting. It can be tempting in the sense that we can develop an arrogancy about life to the point that it's as if we think we are in total control. You know, if you were to make a list of the things that you're in control of in your life, and then make another list of the things that you're not control, in control of in your life. The things that you're not in control of is a much longer list. We are not in control. We need to be careful about developing an arrogance about life. Let me suggest to you a very important reality about life as I close. A man by the name of Edwin White wrote a book called A Sense of Presence in which he made this statement about life. He said, when we reduce life to its essential, only one thing is needful, to have God. I encourage you today to seek God in your life and live consistent with the reality that it's only if the Lord wills. Thank you very much for your attention. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there, and sadly, so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. 
Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. Don't even open their Bibles yet, and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey. In this world we